Okay, so this morning I'm excited to introduce Dr. Katja Kohl, um, who is an assist associate professor in the Department of Biology at Emory University. Uh, Dr. Kohl uh, earned her PhD in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from the University of Michigan, advised by Mercedes Pesqua, and carried out postdoctoral training with Brian Grenfell at Penn State Center for Infectious Disease Dynamics. And uh, Dr. Cole is interested in population dynamics and evolutionary dynamics of infectious diseases. Her research focuses on using modeling approaches to shed light on the drivers of evolutionary change in endemically uh, circulating viral populations with um, a strong focus on influenza and dengue, I think prior to COVID-19 emergence, uh, with a focus on you know, really looking at multiple scales, um, thinking about epidemiology epidemiological levels and within host levels and, and how those um, scales um, combine with each other and interact. Um, and really, um, she is a trailblazer in thinking about phylodynamic models and connecting genetic sequence data with epidemiological dynamics across those um, scales I mentioned. And kind of on a personal note, um, her work on influenza with phylodynamic models was, was pretty fundamental for driving uh, a lot of my dissertation thinking and, and research questions. Um, so uh, there's you know, really a soft spot in my heart for all of all of her work. Um, and um, as many of us, she's kind of uh, shifted to um, carrying out quite a bit of COVID-19 work. Um, her her work has helped um, identify the important you know difference uh, difference between direct and indirect impacts of potential vaccine candidates. Um, looked at recombining genomes of SARS-CoV-2 viruses, um, the impact that SARS-CoV-2 as well as other um, non-pharmaceutical interactions have had on other respiratory vi virus transmission, um, using sequence data on a number of fronts to understand transmission patterns, um, and then uh, looking at transmission bottlenecks between individuals. Um, and, and finally, she you know had a really, really nice perspective on um, just kind of generally what we can learn from SARS-CoV-2 sequence data um, in terms of the pandemic and, and looking ahead. And um, so lots of you know really great research and we're excited to have her here. So with that, I'll let, let you take it away, Dr. Cole. Thanks, Spencer. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, and uh, when was it that I was last at UT Austin? <laughs> Maybe like a decade ago, 15 years ago when we were all a little bit younger. Um, anyhow, uh, let me share my screen. Uh, and everyone can hear me, right? All right, so I've got a um, uh, bunch of slides, but, um, but I know that this is kind of informal also. So I put a few slides in here, which are more like, you know, um, having you kind of, you know, work through certain expectations in terms of what you would see in, in data and so forth, you know, um, so to make this a little bit more, more interactive. Um, uh, so um, what I'd like to kind of talk about today and focus on today are um, transmission bottlenecks, um, viral transmission bottlenecks, um, and also the implications and why they're actually important um, to, to uh, quantify, um, and specifically for SARS-CoV-2. Um, so let me put my pointer on. Okay, so a lot of us in the last, you know, in our careers, um, and also kind of in the last year, you know, working on SARS-CoV-2, have really looked um, focused really at this uh, level, the scale of organization in terms of disease transmission at the level of the population, trying to understand, you know, um, both kind of on a worldwide sc scale how this how this virus is is um, is spreading, you know, and then kind of within single populations um, and how certain um, things like you know control measures, non-pharmaceutical inter interventions, etc., you know, are are affecting rates of spread. Um, uh, as Spencer mentioned, um, my group also kind of focuses at um, kind of lower scales of organization. So um, we're also interested in kind of understanding viral dynamics and kind of what gets transmitted and how much gets transmitted um, within individual transmission events, um, and also kind of dynamics, um, uh, viral dynamics, and also evolutionary dynamics um, within individual hosts. Um, and the reason for kind of you know, my interest kind of at these scales is really to try to understand ultimately kind of, you know, where genetic variation comes from, you know, um, what evolutionary processes actually and what kind of evolutionary processes shape that genetic variation at, at um, you know, at the, at the you know, uh, viral population level. Um, and so um, what I'd like to talk about today is actually kind of um, uh, what we believe, is, you know, SARS uh, is happening here at this scale, but at the single transmission event. 
Um, uh, and this, what I'll be talking about today is um, it's, it's up on um, BioArchive. Um, we never know whether to submit to BioArchive or MedArchive. Um, we sometimes get rejected from one and told to kind of submit to the other. <laughs> It feels horrible to be rejected from a preprint server. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have had that experience. Um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> great. Um, we're not alone. Um, anyhow, um, uh, and I've blocked out kind of the conclusions um, to actually, you know, not not give away the the conclusions at this stage. Um, and all, all the work that I'll talk about today um, is is uh, with a grad student in my group, Mike Martin, who's uh, who's fantastic and really over the last year just really you know stepped up you know his, his research effort you know um, even more than it was beforehand to just kind of take on a, um, a bunch of collaborative projects um, with SARS-CoV-2. Okay um, so um, so we'll be talking about kind of what's happening here you know but it will also be talking about implications of what's happening here at these at some of these other scales. Um, so um, so in terms of just transmission bottlenecks and what they are um, so just to kind of um, you know uh, uh, really um, uh, clarify this, you know, so basically what we're thinking about is kind of that there's an individual who's infected, who you can call um, an index case or a donor individual, um, and they're transmitting the virus to a recipient host. Um, and basically um, you know, what happens during this transmission event, right, is certain um, certain number of kind of virions kind of get across and then a subset of those kind of found the viral infection. Um, so we're interested, so what the transmission bottleneck size is, is really kind of the founding population size um, of virions that initiate infection in the recipient um, and kind of contribute to kind of, you know, uh, um, you know, genetic lineage kind of within, within that recipient. Um, so it's not, you know, the number of virions that basically you know fall on you know the respiratory tract of a recipient you know um, because some of those you know um, could be kind of this because um, some of those will not survive but you know some will go stochastically extinct um, and it's not the uh, unique number of virus genotypes that establish the infection um, transmission bottleneck size is is really founding population size of virions um, in a in a new host. Um, and so um, over the last few years, um, we've also, you know, my lab um, is interested in kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, interfacing models with data, you know, developing, um, you know, disease transmission models and so forth. Um, but we're also kind of interested in, in developing um, statistical approach um, for interfacing, you know, models with data. Um, uh, and so, um, so um, a couple of years ago, we developed, um, and this is together with an MD PhD, a former MD PhD student in my group, Ashley Sobel Leonard. Um, basically, we developed this method, um, which has been talked about in the literature now as a beta binomial method um, to infer transmission bottleneck sizes. Um, so there were kind of existing methods available, but um, they either were restricted to using only parts of the data set or were just very low resolution. Um, so the basic idea here is that we have uh, a donor individual, so we have an established transmission pair, and that transmission pair can be established from just epidemiological data. We know kind of when both individuals got symptoms, maybe we know that, you know, the, one of them kind of traveled and kind of, you know, got infected first. Um, uh, and then we know that there's, so we have an established transmission pair from epidemiological surveillance data. Um, so given that, um, if we have a sample kind of um, a virus sample from the donor and a virus sample from the recipient, um, we can kind of deep sequence, um, you know, the, the viral populations in, in those samples, right, and then um, call variants. And, and what we see here is just, you know, a donor, you know, here's the virus population, deep sequencing of the virus population. Um, and then we can call these variants here are just, you know, two variants are shown, um, variant sites are shown. Um, and here what we see is kind of, you know, this green and this blue you know, variant at these at these frequencies, the dashed line is just the um, variant calling threshold. So below that line, we don't know whether it's effectively real or not. Um, we have this transmission, so we have this founding population size. So this is the bottleneck size, right? And then we have this growth within the recipient host, you know, and then when we actually get a sample, it's, you know, the viral population is already kind of large at that point. Um, and so then again, kind of we can call these variants. So the idea here is, and what the beta binomial method effectively does, is it uses um, the variants that are identified in the donor above the um, variant calling threshold, right, and uses those variant frequencies um, along with information on whether you see those or not in the recipient, you know, um, and also if you do see them at what frequencies they're at um, in the recipient, um, to infer um, this quantity over here, the founding population size. 
Um, so, um, so if any of you are interested, I can you know talk more about the method and so forth. Um, but generally, I want to kind of just give a more um, you know uh, uh, qualitative sort of um, uh, um, I guess um, idea for kind of you know how these variant or how the how these so these, we call these variants, right? Um, uh, they're nucleotide variants. They're, they're not to be confused with, of course, kind of, you know, variants of concern, et cetera. Um, uh, but I want to kind of give a more kind of qualitative kind of um, uh, feel for kind of, you know, data, the data here, you know, of the donor variants and the recipient variants could actually look like and what that means in terms of, you know, inferences for bottleneck size. Um, so, um, so this is the first part where I want, you know, um, you guys to participate. <laughs> um, so, so let's say, right, so we, we have these plots which have been called by Adam Loring's group TV plots um, in the context of flu. Um, so what we can do, right, is we can have from a sample, we can identify all the variants, um, all the nucleotide variants from a donor. And so let's say we have a donor like this, where we have one variant, the green one here at this frequency, maybe at a 10% frequency, right, in, the, in, in that sample. And we have another variant um, at this site, which is the blue one, which might be at 45% frequency, right? Um, so, um, so if there's a large bot, so let's say we just have these two variants in the in the in the donor population. Um, if the the founding population size, um, or if the bottleneck size, transmission bottleneck size, is very large, um, where would you expect kind of the data points to lie if you were to plot variant frequency of a variant in the donor against um, the frequency in the recipient? On the diagonal? Yeah, exactly. Right. And so basically, if you're kind of sampling a lot of virus, right, from the donor, right, and it's being transmitted and it's founding, right, um, uh, it's founding infection in the in the recipient host, what we expect is that um, the, the variant kind of frequencies are going to be lying along this diagonal, right? So we've got this one to one diagonal. And if we kind of see in the data kind of, you know, points kind of cluster kind of along this diagonal, that's an indication that there's a very large bottleneck. Right. What about if there's a, a very small bottleneck, you know, on the order of like, you know, I don't know, one or two, like you see in flu? Still a correlation, but it's all over the place. Okay. Any additions on that? And if it's really small, then it's going to settle on simple fractions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what, what if it's one? <laughs> Zero or one, yeah. Yeah, so if the bottleneck size is one, right, um, then a variant, you know, it's either that that variant has this variant or it has the other, you know, it has the other nucleotide, right, at that site, right? So if the bottleneck size is extremely small, you would expect, you know, dots that are kind of um, here at, you know, frequencies of zero on the recipient or fixed, right? Um, and then, you know, if it's a little bit larger, two, three, four virions, you know, we expect, you know, deviation from that di considerable deviation, you know, as Lorenzo, you said, um, you know, a considerable deviation from that, um, from that one to one line. Okay, great. Um, so just remember that for about, you know, five, five minutes or so from now. <laughs> okay, so um, before kind of I talk about, you know, um, our analysis on SARS-CoV-2 bottlenecks, I just want to kind of you know, um, I mean, people like numbers and so forth, you know, but like, why, why do we actually care? You know, why should we actually kind of quantify um, transmission bottlenecks? Um, so, you know, I think there's a, a few different reasons, you know, um, uh, kind of knowing the bottleneck size really has implications for a few different things. One is actually um, uh, some um, implications for kind of understanding within host um, disease dynamics and disease development into that in the next slide. Um, it also has implications for our ability to identify who infected whom kind of within kind of, you know, transmission clusters, you know, like, for example, in hospital settings. Um, and then kind of at the population level scale, it also has um, uh, implications for like how quickly um, uh, a viral population can actually adapt at the population level. So I'm going to take the next few slides just to go through all three of these. Um, so um, with respect to disease development, um, so there's been a lot of work kind of in the literature on various viruses, um, also on SARS-CoV-2 as I'm showing here, kind of looking at inoculum dose um, and the effect of inoculum dose on within host um, dynamics and also symptom development. So, so this is some work out of Yoshikawa Oko's group um, where they basically took these Syrian hamsters um, and 
um, they gave, you know, in this experimental challenge study where you're actually giving just, you know, a huge inoculum dose anyhow, um, Basically, if you give a low dose, shown here in blue, or a high dose, you know, in red, um, basically the hamsters who have a higher dose do worse. So this is the weight change. So they lose more weight. Um, this is a severity score based on kind of lung images and so forth. Um, and and the ones again, kind of that have a higher dose do worse, right? Have have more disease, uh, have 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 worse symptoms, right? So the red is above the blue generally. Right. Um, and so the inoculum dose has been kind of shown to be kind of, you know, important in, in experimental animal studies, you know, in terms of um, being a factor in terms of, you know, uh, disease development. Um, so there's been, I don't know how many of you have kind of come across some of these um, studies in the literature, but there's been this intriguing, and it's been covered in the, in the media quite a bit, you know, this, this question of kind of whether, you know, what is the um, effectively the inoculum dose for SARS-CoV-2? Um, and there's been this um, kind of these, this hypothesis has, has kind of been, been uh, you know, floating around about, you know, uh, this variolation hypothesis. So what's this variolation hypothesis? So variolation um, goes back to kind of, you know, 15th century kind of China. Um, the idea here was, was it was developed, this is uh, something that was developed in the context of smallpox. So smallpox infections actually had mortality rates of about one out of three, you know, so considerably higher than, than SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so um, one way um, that was kind of developed to kind of keep people from getting infected, so to create immunity, effectively kind of a, effectively a vaccination um, against smallpox was through what's known as variolation. So the idea here is that um, someone who actually had smallpox and especially kind of a mild form of smallpox, you know, and got these kind of scabs, those scabs could be taken off those um, uh, individuals um, and, and pulverized, you know, made into uh, a, a fine powder. Um, and then um, that fine powder would effectively be shot up someone's nose, right, as you can kind of see here. Um, and maybe there was kind of enough live virus in there, or maybe it was just the, the you know, dead virus that, is, that was in there, but that effectively immunized um, uh, individuals, you know, and so they were much less likely to actually get infected with smallpox, um, you know, after this kind of procedure. Um, this procedure actually had one to 2% uh, mortality rate <laughs> itself, um, which, you know, uh, is high, right? Um, uh, and then kind of when this, when this approach, um, uh, basically was adopted in, you know, in Africa and also in Europe, you know, starting in about the 17th centuries. Um, in Europe, it was kind of changed a little bit so that it wasn't actually pulverized and shot up your nose, um, but it actually kind of, um, uh, kind of the pulverized um, scabs were effectively used to kind of make these small punctures. Um, and that also, that had lower mortality rates um, uh, and, and that's called variolation also. Um, and so, um, so, um, so how do we translate this to what's known as the variolation hypothesis? So the variolation hypothesis um, has been, uh, I guess, most strongly put forward by Monica Gandhi um, at UCSF. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, based on, um, you know, potentially kind of studies like this, um, some, you know, uh, some um, uh, correlational sort of analysis about, you know, people on cruise ships and how many people got, got, um, uh, got, you know, uh, developed disease symptoms, you know, from infections on cruise ships and whether they were wearing masks or not. Um, so the idea here is that a mask, you know, so we know that masks really, um, you know, are helpful in terms of preventing infection, you know, both in terms of the person who's wearing the mask, but also, you know, with respect to other, uh, you know, transmitting, you know, the virus to other individuals, you know, it reduces transmission. Um, so that's, that's, that's clear. Um, the idea behind the variolation hypothesis is then maybe if you wear a mask, not only are you protecting yourself from infection, um, but, but if you get infected, you might also be preventing yourself from developing severe disease, right? Um, and the idea here is that if you actually, let's say a lot of variants get across, right? Um, if, you know, if you're wearing a mask, um, you know, you might actually have a, a lower inoculum dose, right? Um, and then, you know, consistent with this, you know, if you have a lower inoculum dose, you might be, be, um, be better off, right? Um, so that's the hypothesis. Um, and so, um, so if you look at like the transmission bottleneck, right? So if the transmission bottleneck, if you kind of do this comparative analysis and lots of individuals, you know, who get severe disease have very high trans, um, you know, if you quantify the transmission bottleneck to them, if they have very high 
um, number of virions, you know, that got across, you know, and the ones who have mild disease, you know, have small bottlenecks associated with, with those infections, you know, that would be support for kind of this variolation hypothesis, right? Um, to some extent. Um, uh, okay, um, so, I, so I think transmission bottleneck size is kind of, you know, um, would be informative of kind of, you know, support for this hypothesis or not. Um, and then kind of um, identifying who infected whom. Um, so if you have a very small transmission bottleneck, right, um, it will be very difficult to actually use minor genetic variation um, to actually figure out who transmitted to whom, right? But if you have a very large transmission bottleneck, um, maybe through deep sequencing viral populations, you could actually figure out transmission chains, right? Um, and then finally, at the population level, um, if there's a very loose transmission bottleneck, so a lot of virions get across, right? You can imagine that in an acute infection, if a beneficial mutation arises here and you have a loose transmission bottleneck, it will be um, transmitted, right? And then in the recipient, it will start off at a higher frequency and then we be able to kind of increase even further. Um, and so with loose transmission bottlenecks, you expect the viral population to be able to adapt much more readily um, and much faster. Um, uh, then if you have tight transmission bottlenecks where beneficial mutations can kind of get lost all the time, right, um, uh, during transmission events. Okay, so given that, um, what's the transmission bottleneck um, for, uh, uh, for um, SARS-CoV-2? Um, so there was this um, paper that came out in Science Translational Medicine um, relatively early on where they deep sequenced um, uh, samples from, uh, they deep sequenced um, the viral population from about 500 um, samples. Um, and this was from February to April, 2020. So very early on um, in the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, and what they estimated was a transmission ball next size of about a thousand. Um, and um, just in contrast, you know, seasonal flu virus is a ball next size um, of one to two effectively, you know? Um, so we were kind of surprised by this finding. Um, and if you look at kind of, um, their approach um, to actually, so they use that, that beta binomial approach that I mentioned. Um, so they use that approach. Um, and this is kind of using a variant calling threshold of 1%. Um, uh, this, what you have here on the x-axis, you have the transmission pair. And then on the y-axis, you have the bottleneck size estimate for that transmission pair. And so you can see a lot of kind of variation here. You have some which have bottleneck sizes of about 1,000 to 5,000. You know, you have some which are kind of much lower, um, but they concluded here with a 1% cutoff that it's on the order of about 1,000. Um, what I found really interesting was when we looked at this, um, uh, if you actually look at the 3% cutoff, um, you get... Um, you get somewhat different results, right? You, you actually have some of these, like for example, this transmission pair over here, you just get this massive drop in terms of bottleneck size from about 200 or so to about two, right? And you actually see that in a number of different cases. Also here, you go from about 100 um, to about two. Um, and so there are kind of these massive movements of transmission bottleneck size estimates um, from when you're using a 1% cutoff to a 3% cutoff, um, which was really kind of disconcerting to us. Um, so what I'm uh, plotting here, so we, we decided to look at these data again, um, and um, we decided to kind of, you know. Sorry, yeah. could you explain the variant calling threshold again? Yeah, so the variant calling threshold is just um, saying, well, uh, what, you know, so if you have um, all these, uh, all these reads, right? Um, and you've kind of um, mapped these, these, these reads onto a reference sequence, right? And you look at a specific site, um, there's going to be, let's say here you have a G and A, you know, that site is polymorphic, right? And you have maybe, uh, let's say 2% of, of um, the reads that kind of, you know, um, at that site, you know, tell you it's G and the other 98%, you know, tell you it's A, right? Um, so then you're, the question is, you know, is that 2% real or is that just because of, you know, these, these deep sequencing, you know, uh, you know, uh, like Illumina and so forth, there's, there's a high error rate, right? So at what point, basically that variant calling threshold is at what point do you believe it's real, right? Um, so, so it's not to say that something that you observe at 2%, you know, um, is spurious, but you're just saying, well, you know, let's not, let's not include that in our analysis because we don't know whether it is actually a 2% in the donor or whether it's just spurious. Does that make sense? And so at 1% threshold, you're saying, no, it's there at 2%, right? Um, and at a 3% threshold, you're saying, uh, let's exclude that from the analysis because we don't know. Okay, so, um, so we decided to kind of plot the data in a different way. Um, 
So here again, we have kind of the donor frequency and here the recipient, just like you looked at it before. And so for this certain transmission pair, these are the variants, right? And so um, here, what we have on this x-axis is this variant that's at, at around 20% or so in the, um, in the donor, right? And you can see that doesn't look like it's transmitted to um, the recipient. Um, but basically this 20% variant is the, the, the point here on the x-axis, which is um, kind of the highest value, right? So it's the maximum donor allele frequency. And so that's what you're seeing here on this x-axis. Um, so it might be kind of, uh, that one might, is probably one of these points, you know? And so um, we plotted here, um, you know, what the ball neck size estimate is for these transmission pairs at a 1% cutoff. And so you can see that, that it's black here, you know? Um, and generally the higher, um, the maximum donor allele frequency, the lower the bottleneck size estimates. So you can see that these are very high over here, right? And then you kind of have lower values. Plus, if you move from a one to a 3% cutoff, so you go from, from this kind of blackish to, to orangish color, right? You see in all of these transmission pairs that, you know, have a high maximum donor allele frequency, you know, you see this precipitous drop, right? Um, uh, so you see, you know, um, uh, in the transmission bottleneck size estimate. Right, um, and you see that kind of uniformly across all these transmission pairs. So what this is telling us is that, um, okay, if you're going from 1% to a 3% cutoff, basically you're lopping off a lot of kind of low frequency variants um, that you would have actually said, you know, um, uh, were actually present in a donor, right? Um, so when you get the systematic drop, you know, in bottleneck size estimates, um, that means that the low frequency variants seem to actually be telling you something different than the high frequency variants. Right, and specifically, the high frequency variants might be telling you that the bottleneck sizes are low, and the low frequency variants might be telling you um, the opposite. Right, um, and that would be consistent with this kind of drop when you increase the cutoff. So, um, so here's a couple of questions. Um, so here, what we have is for this one transmission pair from from the 40 that they had, or 37 that they had. Um, uh, going back to kind of you know um, you know the patterns in these data. Um, you know, so we have these low frequency variants here that are below 4% in the donor. Um, so what are the low frequency donor variants telling us? You know, they're here along this kind of one-to-one -one line, right? So these low frequency variants are telling us that their bottleneck size is very, very large, right? But if you look at this high frequency variant right over here, this is one, this is, this is telling us that, um, that the uh, bottleneck size is actually low. Right, because um, it's not being transmitted, even if it's ten percent. And if the bottleneck size was a thousand, you know, you would expect it to be transmitted. Um, okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to point out to you here on this plot is this variant right here. So this is one that you know, you at that site you don't see any genetic variation in the donor, you know, but you see all um, at that specific site you see um, effectively a, a mutation that's actually fixed in the recipient. Um, so this is likely to come about through kind of transmission of kind of very small, you know, let's say one or two kind of virions and then a de novo mutation happening at those very early stages that then actually fixes. Um, and so what this indicates is that when you actually have a point like this, you shouldn't see any shared genetic variation between a donor and a recipient, right? And so um, this really indicates that these, these points here, you know, are, are um, apparently kind of spurious. Okay, so, um, so I'm gonna kind of just race past um, some of these slides. Um, basically, we did some analysis, which basically show that these low frequency variants, regardless of, of whether there's kind of points up here or anywhere else, you know, are actually very consistent across transmission pairs. Um, uh, what we then did was we actually looked at the epidemiologically linked pairs, you know, um, and then kind of scrambled the pairs, right, to actually see, well, are patterns different if you kind of swap out the true recipient, you know, versus kind of, um, you know, replacing that recipient with kind of a, a random recipient. Um, and what we saw here was that um, patterns of shared genetic variation were exactly the same, um, um, you know, which, uh, you know, in epidemiologically linked transmission pairs versus just scrambled transmission pairs where you have one person from, you know, Eastern side of Austria, the other side in, from Western Austria. Um, and so what this indicates is that those shared variants um, that, that are seen um, seem to be kind of, you know, spurious um, because you wouldn't actually, you know, expect to see shared genetic variation, um, you know, uh, minor shared genetic variation, um, you know, um, between epidemiologically unlinked individuals. 
Um, and then this is kind of the, the smoking gun, I think, um, you know, where we actually looked at kind of the, um, let me move the pictures, um, uh, where we actually looked at the variants that were, um, uh, uh, that were present in multiple samples. And if we kind of plot their frequencies, what we saw is that, you know, this variant, for example, is present in all 43 samples that we looked at and at, at, um, at frequencies that were always between kind of one and 2% and so forth, right? Um, which is, would be very unexpected if these were real. Um, so what we did given this analysis, you know, um, where, you know, where even, you know, we have some here at, you know, four to 5% frequency, we actually said, okay, well, let's, let's just call the variant calling threshold at 6%. That's gonna give us lower resolution, you know, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't bias the estimate. It should just kind of increase the confidence intervals. Um, and that's what we did here in six, with a 6% cutoff. And what you can see is kind of when we, um, you know, when we increase the variant calling threshold to 6%, um, uh, what we see is, you know, bottleneck sizes that are, are, are on the order of about one to three. Um, and we kind of used, um, because there's not much data from any of these transmission pairs at this point, because you're excluding so much, you know, so many of the called variants, which we think are spurious. Um, we kind of combined the data in a statistically appropriate way to kind of um, estimate an overall kind of distribution, um, kind of zero inflated um, Poisson distribution for, for how many variants actually are in that founding population. And what we find is, is on the order of about one to three. Um, uh, with the mean being something like one and a half. Um, so most, uh, and this is consistent with, of course, kind of flu, um, where, where it's uh, really nice work out of Adam Loring's group indicates that's like one or two um, uh, uh, variants that kind of get across. So very, very small transmission bottleneck. Okay, so, uh, you know, I know kind of you generally have kind of discussions and so forth. Um, so we can kind of, you know, maybe we can kind of discuss, you know, these results in, in the context of, you know, the plausibility of this variolation hypothesis, you know, um, and whether, you know, that means we should just kind of give up, you know, trying to identify who infected whom from, from genetic variation, you know, um, and also kind of, um, you know, uh, talking about kind of constraints on viral adaptation. I think that's, I think that's all I've got. Oh, you're, you're not going to tell us the answers. We have to come up with the answers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this well, is I do want to actually mention, I'm happy. Well, let me actually talk about this one. Yeah. Um, I think this one's super interesting, you know, because obviously, you know, okay, so if we have small bottlenecks, we should expect those small bottlenecks to slow down rates of adaptive evolution. And we all know about all the variants of concern that are circulating, you know, in Brazil and the UK, you know, everywhere now, you know, um, uh, and South Africa, you know, so, um, so, so then the question is, okay, well, how, how is this virus, how is this virus actually then adapting, right? Um, and so, um, so, uh, so I think there's some interesting possibilities here. Um, uh, one is many of you have probably kind of come across this virological post, you know, where basically it shows um, sequences kind of from this, um, from the root, you know, which is close to the Wuhan, you know, um, uh, strain. Um, so basically, um, this is distance um, in, in, the, in terms of that phylogeny to, to the root. And these are the kind of the sequences that are kind of non B117, you know, um, uh, from sequences from the from COG UK sequences. Um, and then what you can see here is this B117 lineage, right? Um, uh, and you can kind of see this really precipitous jump, right? Um, if you look at the slope here, of B117, uh, that lineage kind of evolving kind of at the host population level, you know, um, you know, since, you know, since I guess uh, October, November in the UK and the slope here, you see the same slope. So it seems like these, uh, these two lineages are kind of, you know, or the B117 versus the other lineages are evolving at the same rate um, at the population level, but you can see this really precipitous kind of, you know, jump, right? Um, and it's this jump, right, um, that, that has been kind of, you know, pointed at for kind of saying, okay, well, you know, maybe what happened here is maybe, you know, someone who was, you know, immunocompromised or immunosuppressed, you know, had a long-term infection with SARS-CoV-2. We know from certain examples that are that have been published, you know, of long-term, you know, chronic infections um, with SARS-CoV-2, that there's a lot of evolutionary changes that happen kind of within hosts, chronically infected hosts. Um, and so maybe there was kind of spilled back into the human population. Um, and so it was actually kind of this virus was, you know, <coughs> effectively incubated kind of um, 
you know, within chronically infected individual, which of course then argues kind of for, you know, um, trying to kind of, you know, uh, you know, prioritize, you know, immunosuppressed, immunocompromised individuals for vaccination, right? Um, uh, and so, um, so maybe the virus population is kind of, you know, and there's also indication that the South African lineage, you know, has also kind of come about from an kind of, uh, individual who might be kind of immunocompromised. Um, so I, I think there's a role of, you know, for that, you know, um, you know, especially kind of given very tight transmission bottlenecks. Um, the other possibility is kind of shown up here, which is, you know, um, and I have kind of this, these slot machines here, um, this is from, from, from kind of, um, uh, a talk I heard of, of Adam Loring's, you know, where basically, you know, maybe what 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 happens is, you know, uh, uh, new genetic variants, you know, new nucleotide variants kind of emerge stochastically within kind of an individual, you know, because of that small transmission bottleneck, you know, like that, like this point up here, right? Um, and you know, fixed because of genetic drift, you know, but then actually have a transmission advantage. Right, um, and so it's kind of like playing slots, right? It's kind of you know the luck of the draw, you know. But there's so many people playing slots and so many transmission events um, that kind of once you kind of you know uh, kind of win at the lottery, right? Um, you know, or win at the slot machine, you know, you can kind of you have a higher individual R not basically. Um, so that's another possibility. Um, 